Let's pray. And Father, again, I just want to stop and confess to you that we, me, I, am a beggar. This is true. And in this moment, we all come to your table asking, begging to be fed. And so I pray that through your word now, according to your mercy in Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us and feed us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. The most important thing that we need to see this morning in this passage is the mercy of God. Other, other things are happening, other important things are happening in Genesis 19. But the most important thing for us to see is the mercy of God. Great and glorious, front and center, the mercy of God is the theme of this chapter. And I realize that that might sound a little bit strange to you this morning because uh, when we read about fire and sulfur raining down from heaven, we probably don't immediately think about mercy. Right? This is not, that's typically not what comes to mind when we think about mercy. Uh, but nevertheless, I, mercy is the theme here. Now, to be clear, God does execute judgment in this passage and, and throughout the Bible, and even I think in popular culture, Sodom and Gomorrah are quintessential when it comes to the judgment of God. But still, the most important thing in this story is not God's judgment, but it's God's mercy. And in order for us to see that this morning, I think the first thing we should do is just back up for a minute and get an overview of the chapter. Just back up and just walk through, big picture here, what is happening in Genesis 19. And when we, when we do that, when, when we step back, I think we'll see this story actually unfolds in really four different stages. And each of the four stages of the story, they pertain to a particular moment in the day. There's a a time of day here that it shows up over and over again. And I'm going to mention those. I'm going to mention those four four points. I'll fill in the gaps. But I want you just to see first the four times of day that are mentioned here. First is in verse 1 when the two angels or the two messengers also, uh, the two messengers or angels, they look like two men. So don't think invisible angelic creatures with wings. These are two men who come to the city. And it says first in verse 1, they came to Sodom in the evening. All right, so look, verse 1, it starts in the evening. Then in verse 15 we read, as the morning dawned. And then thirdly, we see in verse 23, when the sun had risen on the earth. And in verse 27, we see when Abraham went early in the morning. And so if we're just looking through the timeline here of what's said in chapter 19, it's first nighttime, and then it's the next morning at the break of dawn. Then it's thirdly when the sun had completely risen. And then fourthly, it's, it's still early in the morning, full morning, but still early. And, and we're given, for whatever reason, we're given um, a timeline here. We're given these images of how these events transpire. And people don't know exactly why. We don't, we're not sure why the author here in Genesis 19 gives us these details. But at, at the very least, as I was thinking about it, I think one thing it helps us to do as we look at this story is that it helps our imaginations. Like we're given a, an image here of what time of day it is when these things are happening. And it's over about a 12-hour period, right? So at first, again, in this literal span of time, it starts when it's nighttime and dark, and it leads to when it's morning and light. Nighttime to morning time, dark to light. And so as we're walking through the text, I just want you to have those images in your mind. Just think about nighttime when it's dark, and think about the early morning when the, the sun comes up, because that's how this story unfolds. It's, it first again happens at nighttime. So it's nighttime. These two messengers, these two men, they come into the city of Sodom. And Lot, we're told in verse 1, was sitting at the gate, sitting in the gate of Sodom. And right away, what this is meant to do, it's meant to contrast for us Lot and Abraham, because in the chapter just before this, in chapter 18, that chapter opens in verse 1, telling us that Abraham was sitting at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. And so chapter 18, Abraham is sitting at the door of his tent. Chapter 19, Lot is sitting at the gate of Sodom. And what's that? that that's meant to take us back to chapter 13, when Abraham and Lot separated. So if you can remember back in chapter 13, 
Lot is Abraham's nephew, and they used to all live together until their herdsmen came into some conflict. Their shepherds came into conflict, and so they decided to separate, and Lot decided to leave Abraham for the Jordan Valley. Lot, Lot looked around, and he looked over in the east, and he saw that in the east, in the valley, it was lush and fertile and abundant, and so Lot checked out on Abraham, and he moved there. And the, the Bible tells us in chapter 13, verse 12, that Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. That's chapter 13. And so now, by the time we get to chapter 19, Lot has been living in Sodom for a while, and he has become, as far as we can tell, a bona fide urbanite. He is sitting in the gates of the city. Meanwhile, Abraham, he's sitting out by his tent, out by the Oaks of Mamre. Remember the Oaks of Mamre? He's in the boonies. So, uh, Lot is here in Sodom. And we see these two messengers coming to the city, and, and Lot greets these two messengers, and he invites them to stay in, in, in his house. The two messengers, at first, they, they decline. They, they want to stay in the town square, and, and Lot, he pressures them. No, 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 you need to please stay at my house. Trust me, you want to stay at my house? And so they decide to stay with him. And so after they have dinner, just before bedtime, all of a sudden, Lot and these two messengers they hear some commotion outside. It's dark, remember, it's nighttime. There's some noise, there's some yelling. And what has happened is that as the sun has gone down, as it has become dark, the men of the city have all gathered outside Lot's door and they are demanding that Lot give them the two messengers because they want to physically harm them. The men of Sodom, as a gang, have come to Lot's house with the intentions of violating these two men. Lot refuses, and so the mob gets angry, and then they turn on Lot. But then the two messengers make all the men go blind. They rescue Lot, and eventually things settle down. And the two messengers inside the house where they're safe, they say to Lot, look, do you have any other friends, any other family that you want to tell this to, because this is what's about to happen. Verse 13, we're about to destroy this place because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Judgment's coming, Lot. Go tell whoever you want to tell. And so Lot goes and he tells his, his two sons-in-laws. They think he's joking. And then it's the crack of dawn, verse 15. The sun is just starting to rise and it means the time has come. The two messengers save Lot and his wife and their two daughters, and they let them flee to Zoar. Then the sun has completely risen. Lot and his family are out of Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 23. And so God started raining down fire and sulfur, and the text says that God destroyed everything. This is an important note. God destroyed all the inhabitants of the city and even everything that grew from the ground. Completely annihilated. And then it's later in the morning. Still early morning, but later in the morning, and we see Abraham. First time he's mentioned here in the story, Abraham is standing, looking towards Sodom and Gomorrah and the Jordan Valley, and he is looking at the smoke at what, at what used to be these cities. The smoke of these cities is rising to the air. And, and I, I read this and think about this. I'm trying to visualize this. I, th I think about some of the videographers in our church, like Tristan and Andrew, if you guys are here. This is like that scene in the movie where like the camera pans out behind Abraham and then like gets a shot of his back and then off in the distance you see the smoke rising up in the air and it's just early more in silence. It just ends that way. That's what's happening here. Abraham is looking at what's left of these cities, just smoke in the air. That's what's going on. That's, that's chapter 19. That's the story here of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the chapter ends in chapter 19 with the downfall of Lot. There's a lot of significance there, but we, we're not going to get into all that. But this is, this is 19 in a nutshell. That's the overview just to walk through the story. Hoken read a few verses there. Thanks, thanks for doing that, bro. But I want you just to get the full panorama of what's happening there. Now, having seen that, 
having, you've probably heard, read this story before, but having seen that now, I want us to look at three things in particular. I want us to look at three questions that I think help us dig into the passage a little bit more. Here they are. Number one, what is wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah? What is right with Lot and his family? And third, what is true about the mercy of God? Let me just start first with Sodom and Gomorrah. Bad news before good news. What is wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, now, we should have known before we get here in chapter 19 that something is wrong with Sodom. Even back in chapter 13, after Lot chooses to go live in Sodom, there's this little verse thrown in there, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 13, a little, little verse thrown in there. It says, now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. That's chapter 13. Now, now, by chapter 18, if we're reading, chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord says to Abraham that the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah has become great and their sin is very grave. All right, this is all before we get to chapter 19. Then here in chapter 19, just so we don't miss it, just so it's clear, we read again in verse 13 that the outcry against the people of Sodom has become great before the Lord. That's why God is sending judgment, because of the outcry. And the outcry is because of their sin. Their sin is very grave, says chapter 18, verse 20. But still, what does that mean? Like, how bad is it? What, what, what is going wrong in Sodom? Two, two things. First is that Sodom and Gomorrah are sexually immoral. We already know that it's very grave. The text says that. But we're not shown what that looks like until the two messengers come to visit in chapter 19. That's when we're actually given a glimpse into the depravity of of these two cities. Verse 4 says that every single man in the city, young and old, down to the last man, emphasizing every single man in the city, formed a mob. They came to Lot's door demanding to assault the two messengers. And you guys know I'm being careful with my words here, okay? You know what this is really happening here, okay? There are layers of depravity that are happening in this story. Layers of depravity. The first is same-sex sin. Not by a few men, but by every single man in the city, which means we're talking about a mob here, okay? And then it becomes non-consensual, shameless demanding at the hands of the mob, which shows their pride. I mean, they, they truly are shameless. And then we see it gets violent. The, the mob is trying to beat down Lot's door to get to these two messengers. This is the kind of wickedness that's going on here in Sodom. And to be clear, this is not the only sin happening in Sodom. It's not. Later in the Bible, actually, in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, he's talking, he's, he's looking back historically on Sodom. And this is what he says. He says, Sodom was a city full of pride and excess of food and prosperous ease, but they did not aid the poor and the needy. So there are more kinds of wickedness happening in these cities. But when Genesis 19 wants to demonstrate how bad the wickedness is, it shows us same-sex gang violence. This is happening here. There may be lower levels of wickedness in societies. You get to a point where you, you just, you can't grade evil, right? But the combination here of sexual immorality, violence, and pride is as bad as anything we can imagine. It's meant to be as bad as anything we can imagine. This is a society so curved in on itself, so hostile toward God's design that it attempts to force every non-compliant individual to join in their debauchery. We will break down your door. That's what's happening here in Genesis 19. You saw, you read the story. This is happening here. And so I think we should understand 
that all of this didn't start, what we read here in Genesis 19, it didn't start with mobs trying to break down doors. We don't, we don't know exactly where it started. It, it, maybe it started with, with these mobs forcing the non-compliant to approve of their debauchery. We, we don't really know. We don't know. We don't know where it all started. We just know that the sin of Sodom led to, it ended up here with mobs trying to break down doors. And that's because rebellion against God is never content to stay where it is. That's just a category for you. Rebellion against God is never content to stay where it is. That goes for societies, that goes for individuals, and it's especially true when it comes to sexual deviance. So hear me on this, okay? Just hear this for a minute. Sexual deviance, even of the smallest degree, is on the trajectory toward mobs beating down doors. And that's not where most people end up, thanks to God's comment. That's not where most people end up, but that is where it wants to take you. And I know, again, that sounds a little crazy. Sounds strange, but it's true. Rebellion against God, rebellion against God does not have guardrails. And if that's true of all rebellion against God, it's especially true of sexual rebellion. That's because our sexuality is where we come into closest contact with God's design. God made us. And so if we are hostile toward God, it will show up there. That's why the apostle Paul He says in 1 Corinthians 6 that sexual sin is different from other sins because sexual sin is sin against our own bodies. And whatever way, somehow sexual sin is an attack on ourselves because ourselves carry the design of God, the image of God, God's design. And this kind of rebellion, this kind of deviance, it is all on one continuum. It's all on the same line, okay? Whether it's being physically inappropriate with someone, whether it's oogling images that should never exist, or whether it's drunken raves in some abandoned warehouse, it's all on the same continuum. It's all on the same line. And left unchecked, Left unchecked, it will lead to beating down doors. Just like we see here in Genesis 19. Lust has a bottomless appetite. A bottomless appetite. That's one thing wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah. Second thing. Secondly, Sodom and Gomorrah are intolerant of moral valuations. Notice in verse 6 that at first when the mob came to Lot's door... Lot tries to reason with them. He goes out uh, to the entrance of the door and he says to the men, verse 7, Look, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Then they reply to him, verse 9, This fella came to sojourn and he has become a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So get what's happening here, okay? This is a mob of wicked men doing wicked things and they get enraged when Lot calls what they're doing wicked. Now, as far as we can know, according to the text here, Lot has been getting along fine with his neighbors. Many commentators say based upon Lot sitting at the gate of Sodom, that most likely he had accrued some prominence over time. That's a prestigious place to be. He was uh, possibly a leader, uh, some kind of leader in the city. And so apparently, as best as we can tell, Lot had not been mistreated by the men of the city until he makes a moral valuation. The men of Sodom are okay with Lot until Lot says that what they are doing is wicked. That is when, in their pride, the men of Sodom turn their focus from violence against the messengers to violence against Lot. And this is a really significant part of the story right here. It's another indication, meant to show us an, an, another, another level here of how depraved this city was. They refuse for any moral judgment to be made of them. According to their worldview, 
What is worse than same-sex gang violence is someone calling same-sex gang violence wicked. You see it? That's what enrages them. It's called wicked. They were coming for the two messengers until Lot says, hey, don't be so wicked. Then they're coming for Lot. How dare Lot call that wicked? Sodom and Gomorrah are intolerant of moral valuation. That's the second thing going wrong here. I just want to clarify on this. The men of Sodom are angry with Lot, the text says, but they're not really angry with Lot. They are, but they're not, okay? It's interesting here that they use the word judge in verse 9. They say, oh, how can you be a judge? Verse 9. The last time that word was used is in chapter 18, verse 25, and that's when God is called the judge of all the earth. And so I think we're supposed to link these two together in chapter 18 and chapter 19. These men are taking their anger out on Lot, but they're really just mad at God. This is how this goes, right? They are mad at the God they don't believe in, and so they displace that aggression toward those who reflect God's moral law. This was happening. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot a lot's going wrong here. Those are two things. Now the second question, what is right with Lot and his family? What's wrong with Sodom and Gomorrah? What is right with Lot and his family? This is a, this is a short point because the answer is not much, okay? Uh, we, we, we had our suspicions about Lot before we get to this chapter, but then we start reading it and we see that Lot is a clown, man. Like, and I, I mean that almost literally because when the messengers tell Lot, they say, hey, you know, go warn people to, to leave with you. He goes to his sons-in-laws and he tells, he tells them, he tells his sons-in-law that judgment is coming in verse 14 and they think he's joking. They think Lot is doing an act. They don't, they don't take him seriously. And so according to this chapter, we, we read this chapter and we see that Lot does not look very good. I mean, we, we saw what he did in chapter, in, in verse 8, right? The, the messengers tried to get in. I mean, the, the mob tried to get the messengers, and Lot says, take, take my two daughters instead. He's a, he's a scoundrel, man. Like, this is, he's not a good guy. He's not a good guy. Now, there's one place, though. This is, we got to work with this. There's one place in the New Testament where Lot is called righteous, in 2 Peter chapter 2. But... Lot is only called righteous there in comparison to the wickedness of Sodom. And it really has to do with chapter 18, the chapter just before this one. We're supposed to read chapter 19, I believe, in light of chapter 18, because in chapter 18 is where we see Abraham's prayer. Abraham prayed in chapter 18 that God not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the small number of righteous people who live there. Presumably, he's talking about Lot and his family. We're supposed to connect those dots. But the story, when we, when we read 19, the story makes a much lesser deal about their righteousness and a much bigger deal about Abraham's intercession. We're supposed to see chapter 19 as an answer to Abraham's prayer. That's the whole reason why the whole city of Zoar is mentioned, that little story where Lot's like, uh, let's send me to this little city, Zoar, and, and they do it. What happens with that is that if, in chapter 18, uh, Abraham asks God, do not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because Lot is there. And God answers that prayer, okay? While Lot is in Sodom, God does not destroy Sodom. But then he gets Lot out of Sodom and the judgment comes. Well, Lot moves to the city of Zoar, and now the same principle applies. Still in answer to Abraham's prayer, God doesn't destroy Zoar because Lot is there. See? This whole thing is an answer to Abraham's prayer in chapter 18. That's what we're supposed to see. This is because Abraham prayed, and God will not destroy a city even if there's only 10 righteous there, which is what Abraham prayed. And to make it super clear here in chapter 19, the story ends in verse 29 when the camera pans out. Remember, the camera pans out, verse 29, and there's Abraham standing there looking at the smoke in the distance. And, and this is what verse 29 says. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, 
God remembered Abraham. Abraham, on one level, has nothing to do with this story. He's not even there. But it says here in the end, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. This story, the whole time, has really been about Abraham. The story's been about God and Abraham. God is being faithful to Abraham. God answered Abraham's prayer. And the main thing in the prayer that he answered is not judgment, it's mercy. Let me show you that. This is the last point. Last question. What is true about God's mercy? So this story about Sodom's judgment ends with Abraham, verse 27 to 29. And I think it means that now we're supposed to actually look through Abraham's perspective to see this story. We're, we're supposed to be looking at this whole story now from Abraham's vantage. That's how this works. We're, we're now standing with Abraham looking in the distance at the fire and sulfur raining down. And when we look at the fire and sulfur and when we see the smoke going up like a furnace, we're supposed to see God's mercy. Now, how in the world is that? How? How? What is true about the mercy of God? Two things. First, God delights in showing mercy, not judgment. This is a category for you, okay? In the Bible, we see that God shows both mercy and judgment. God forgives sinners and God punishes sinners. And everything about that is right. It is always right. But when it comes to the heart of God, showing mercy is God's delight, which means God shows mercy in a different way than he shows wrath. We see this very clearly again in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 23, Ezekiel 18, 23, God says, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? Verse 32, for I, this is God speaking, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone declares the Lord God. So turn and live. And we see that in chapter 19. God is not foaming at the mouth to hurl down judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. He sends messengers to the city to warn everyone. He sends messengers there to tell Lot, to tell everyone else he knows and wants to tell to get out of the city because destruction is coming. God delights to show mercy, not judgment. We also see this in the book of Jonah. It's really interesting. Jonah, the prophet Jonah, is the only prophet in the Bible who wanted to withhold mercy from the wicked. He wanted to withhold mercy from Nineveh. And we know what happened to him, right? He got swallowed by a whale, all right? God rebuked him and a whale swallowed him. And the book ends, this is an an amazing thing. The book of Jonah ends, God speaking again, and God is saying, I have pity on Nineveh. I have pity on their cattle. God delights in showing mercy. Also in in the book of Micah, chapter 7, verse 18. This is as clear, this is straight up. This is as clear as it gets in Micah, chapter 7. I mean, I remember reading this verse at a hard time in my life. And just, just saying, God, this is what the Bible says. Here it is. Who is a God like you? Micah, who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He, God, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights to show mercy. We need to know this about God. God delights to show mercy. God is happy to give mercy. God delights in mercy, not judgment. Second thing here. There are, in this story, untold depths to the mercy of God. Let me just just show you a few here. Just like there are layers of depravity in this story, there are layers of mercy, and his mercy is more. Look at the first layer of mercy. 
It's the very fact that God sends two messengers to warn Lot and his family of the coming. It's the very fact that these two angels came to the city to bring this warning. The text wants us to know this is mercy, okay? This is not because Lot deserved it, all right? We get a good picture of Lot here. We're not impressed by Lot in chapter 19. The two messengers are God's mercy to Lot. The, God is being faithful to Abraham, and that means Lot gets mercy. These two messengers come, and they give him a chance to get out of there before it starts raining fire. Second layer. The second layer of mercy is when the mob turns on Lot. Remember that in verse 9? After Lot calls the mob wicked, the mob says that now they are going to deal worse with Lot than they were the two messengers. I don't even know what that means. I don't know how you can deal worse with Lot than they were with the two, but they are. That's what they say. But this is what happened. This is a, this is a I mean, dramatic scene here. They're going for Lot. The mob is going for Lot. We're going to do, deal worse with you. They pressed hard against Lot, tried to grab him, but then the two messengers reached out they're standing at Lot's doorway. They reach out of Lot's doorway. They pull Lot inside the house. They slam the door. And then the two messengers make all the people in the mob go blind. They just make them all go blind. And then eventually they, they get tired and they, they just lay leave. And so the two messengers, God, through these messengers, rescues Lot from becoming a victim of his city's evil. God, arrest, God rescued Lot. It's mercy. And then third, the third layer of mercy comes the morning of judgment. The two men are very clear to Lot. I mean, this is super clear. We read it here. They're very clear to Lot about what is about to happen. God's punishment is about to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the two messengers tell Lot in verse 15, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here Get out of here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. And that's mercy, right? We agree, that's mercy. The very fact that these two messengers are here and tell Lot to leave is mercy. Get out of here, Lot, before you are destroyed. That's mercy. Then in verse 16, maybe the strangest sentence in the book of Genesis. Verse 16. But Lot lingered what are you doing man it's about to rain fire like lava is about to fall from the sky on your head they told you to leave they said get out of here hurry up go you're going to be swept away and he stalls He doesn't leave. He stands there. He, he lingers. In verse 16. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. They brought him out and set him outside the city. And there it is in this story. Great and glorious front and center, the mercy of God. The text says it. God being merciful to Lot. God is being merciful to Lot. The text says it so clearly here. The whole thing has been mercy, but here is just another depth of mercy, and it's mercy that we really could not fathom, because back in chapter 18, Abraham prayed to God. To, he, he stopped at 10. Remember, he's, he's praying, if there's this many, if there's this many, God, if there's 10, would you spare the city? And God says, yes, okay. In 18 verse 32, God says, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy the city this isn't 10 this is 4 and they're lingering this isn't 10 righteous people in the city this is 4 people who are lingering and God seizes them by the hand and he snatches them out of the way of the coming destruction. We are talking about here untold depths of mercy. 
This is mercy that we never expected. We did not see. We're not, this is supposed to shock us. This is mercy that we did not see coming. And there's even more mercy than this. There's even more mercy than this because there was another time, much later than Genesis 19, when God's mercy shocked our expectations. And it was in an event much more intense than this one. It didn't include messengers coming or a fire in the sky. But instead, it was when God himself came in the person of Jesus Christ. And God's judgment fell not on us, but on Jesus for us. When Jesus came and died on the cross in our place, he was bearing the fire and sulfur that should have landed on our heads. When Jesus died on the cross in our place, it was God reaching out and seizing us by the hand. Has he seized you like that? Has he? Has God reached out and grabbed you? Have you been seized by God? I don't know, I don't know where we're all coming from this morning. But I do know. Because the Bible says it, if you put your faith in Jesus and his death for you, if you put your faith in Jesus right now, if you put your faith in Jesus and his death for you, God being merciful to you will seize you. And he will take you and he will keep you and he will never, ever let you go. Because he delights to show mercy right now. That's what this table is about. This is what the table reminds us of. At this table, as we take the bread and the cup, as we remember the death of Jesus, we are remembering the mercy of God to us. And, and in this meal, when, when we take this meal, we experience the delight of God. We, we enjoy this meal in the joy of God because this meal is about God's mercy. This is the evidence of God's grace. And if that's true for you, if that's true for you, if you trust in Jesus, if you have been seized by God, I wanna invite you to come and to eat and drink with us this morning. The servers in the band can come and as they come forward and prepare the table, I'm gonna pray for us. Father, We are hemmed in by mercy all the days of our life, behind, before us, in this moment. We are drenched in mercy. You have seized us. Seize us still, Father, we pray. Seize us still, according to your great mercy in Christ. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to serve the bread first. You can raise your hand if you prefer the gluten-free. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.